The third and final chiefdom we will explore in detail is the traditional culture of Samoa in the South Pacific. The Samoans have long held a prominent place in the history of cultural anthropology thanks to the pioneering work of Margaret Mead there in the 1920s. As we'll see, Samoan culture is both an excellent example of chiefdom organization and also starkly different from the other chiefdoms we've been studying. The Samoan islands lie in the tropics of the South Pacific in the huge triangle known as Polynesia. Polynesia is both a geographical and a cultural unit. It encompasses all the small islands scattered across many thousands of miles of open ocean, but more importantly, the inhabitants of all these islands share many aspects of language, history, and culture. Polynesia was one of the last places on Earth to be settled, with most of the islands only being reached by humans in the last couple thousand years. Samoa itself is on the western side of Polynesia. It consists of a dozen or so small islands, not all of which are inhabited. All are volcanic in origin, as are most Polynesian islands. Altogether, they cover only about 1,200 square miles of landmass, most of which is made up by the two largest islands. The Samoan islands are divided between two jurisdictions. The western part of the chain is the independent nation of Samoa, but the eastern islands, only about 76 square miles total, have been a territory of the United States since the 1920s. The landscape of all the Samoan islands is stunning. They consist of fertile, well-drained volcanic soils. Hills and mountains rise steeply from the shores to broad interior plateaus. Owing to their tropical location, the climate is quite pleasant, varying from the 70s to the lower 90s year-round. The ocean location means there is always ample rainfall to support the lush, tropical vegetation that naturally covers almost the entire island chain. In such a pleasant, mild environment, life is fairly easy for Samoans. Like all Polynesians, they're agriculturalists. Their primary crops are taro, coconuts, yams, and bananas. These crops all grow very well in the rich island soils once the native vegetation has been cleared through slash and burn. They keep pigs and chickens as domestic animals, brought with the original settlers from, ultimately, East Asia. But the chickens are kept mostly for their eggs, and pigs are only slaughtered on special occasions. Most daily protein in the traditional Samoan diet comes from fish and other aquatic animals that surround the islands. While everyone farms and most people fish along the coasts, a special class of professional fishermen are tasked with large-scale open-water fishing expeditions that yield vast hauls of fish to be distributed throughout the communities. Samoan society varies a bit from one island to another and from one village to another on the same island. However, all Samoans share in common that their communities are organized around the Aiga. An Aiga is, roughly speaking, a large extended family, but the significance it carries in Samoan society is much more than that. Most aspects of daily life are structured around one's Aiga, which resides together, or at least near one another, and cooperates both socially and economically. The Aiga would be quite similar to the sorts of strongly developed lineages we saw among the newer if it weren't for the great flexibility we see in Aiga membership. Whereas newer lineages are strictly patrilineal, an Aiga is an ambilineal, ambilocal organization. This means that a person can claim membership in both his or her father's and mother's Aiga. Someone can even call on affinal ties and claim membership in the Aiga of his or her spouse. After marriage, a newlywed couple can choose whose Aiga to live and associate with. Because of these very open rules, a single person might be able to claim membership in as many as 12 Aigas spread across several villages, and he can also choose to change his Aiga association at almost any time. That kind of flexibility in residence and association is something that we haven't seen in this course since we studied the Chactoisi at the beginning of the semester, and here it may function in largely the same way. In either case, flexibility allows for quick response and adaptation to changing conditions in an uncertain environment. While agriculture is fairly reliable in the Samoan Islands, their isolated location makes potential shortages a huge risk. If crops fail, there's literally nowhere else to go. 
A more rigid system might lead to disaster in that case, so Samoan society allows for adjustments on the fly. Each Aiga owns property collectively and works cooperatively to farm it. They also own fishing canoes, tackle, and other tools and implements collectively. The management of these group resources falls squarely on the shoulders of the Aiga's chief, known as the Matai. Like all chiefdom societies, Samoan society is hierarchically ranked. The Matai must belong to the correct branch of the Aiga's family tree. Members of other branches are considered lower ranking and not qualified to hold the office. However, when the past Matai dies, there will frequently be several men of the appropriate age and lineage to succeed him. The other members of the Aiga will gather and elect their next chief from among these candidates, who will then hold the position for the rest of his life. Sons of previous chiefs are given preference, but not to the extent of electing an incompetent or wholly unpopular chief. Thus, candidacy for a chiefship is ascribed through rank and descent, but actually holding the office of chief is an achieved status granted by the people of the Aiga. The duties of a Matai in Samoan society are many. He is expected first and foremost to manage the Aiga's resources, allocating farming plots to the various families among his followers, and making sure that houses, canoes, and so forth are properly maintained. He should also collect and set aside a portion of each harvest, or in more recent times, monetary income, for potential emergencies or obligations. Second, he also settles any small disputes that arise within the Aiga. And finally, the Matai represents the Aiga's interests in the village council. The most important duty of the Matai is probably the first, allocating and managing land use. The Samoan islands are small, with restricted land and comparatively dense populations. It's essential for the community's survival that each village uses its available land in as efficient a manner as possible. Samoans divide their land up into four categories. The first category is village residential space. This is where people build their houses and live. The individual household owns its own house and has rights to exclusive use of the area immediately surrounding it, but permission to build in a specific location can only be given by the Matai. Outside the village space lies the agricultural plots under most intensive cultivation. These plots are allocated to individual families by the Matai for their own use. They're considered to own the land itself, though they don't have the right to sell this land to others. A bit farther from the village lies family reserve land, owned and farmed collectively by the Aiga. Work here is coordinated by the Matai and produces community property to be distributed among all the families of the Aiga equally. The Matai may also choose to lease these lands to other villages or Aigas if his own family does not need them. The lessee then owns the produce from the field, but not the land itself. The final category of land is village land. This is far from the village and usually in terrain that is unsuitable for cultivation. It's held as community property by all the Aigas of the local village, usually left in its natural state. However, an enterprising and motivated man may petition the village council for permission to clear a plot and farm there. He's then free to wring any profit he can from the plot for as long as he cares to do so. When he abandons the plot, it reverts to community property. This segues us nicely into discussing how Samoan communities are organized at the level above the Aiga. Of course, today, the Samoan and American administrations govern several islands together, but these political structures are the phenomena of the 20th century, and even so, they have relatively little influence on daily activities. Traditionally, the population of any given island was divided into several independent villages. There was no political organization that encompassed the entire island, unlike other Polynesian islands like Hawaii or Fiji. Today, villages still function largely autonomously in most daily matters, much like American towns mostly take care of their own streets and water systems. Each Samoan village has residents belonging to several aigas. The matais of these aigas collectively determine village policies through a council called the Fono, which meets regularly. Tribal villages like the Yanomami also make community decisions through councils, 
but in those egalitarian communities, everyone participates. In Samoan chiefdoms, only chiefs debate at the council, after which they deliver their decisions to the community at large. Thus, these councils are not egalitarian. Furthermore, even within the council itself, debate is not fully egalitarian. Samoan chiefs belong to several different categories, each of which is hierarchically ranked alongside the others. The two broadest categories are chief and talking chief. Chiefs outrank talking chiefs, and each of these is further divided into three ranks. Each aiga possesses a single chiefly title of one of those six possible ranks. And as we've discussed, each Aiga elects a chief to the council to represent its interests. Every chief on the council has an opportunity to speak in debate, but they play different roles in the discussion. Talking chiefs set the agendas of council meetings and manage the order of discussion, while the opinions of chiefs, and especially high chiefs, carry more weight. Debate doesn't necessarily continue until a consensus is reached, it continues only until it's clear that the highest ranking chiefs on the council have decided on a course of action. Lower ranking chiefs must simply acquiesce, as must the non-chiefs waiting outside the council house. Because of the inherently non-egalitarian structure of the phono, it's important that every participant understand his place in the hierarchy and role in the debate. For that reason, Every phono meeting begins with an elaborate ritual in which a ceremonial drink called kava is prepared, then served to each chief in order of precedence. This publicly reiterates the ranks of each chief present and reminds them of who's in charge. The phono sets policies and makes decisions that affect the entire village. Implementing those policies is the responsibility of the Almaga and Awaluma. These are groups made up of all the non-chiefs in the village, what anthropologists call gender organizations. A gender organization is one to which all or most of the community members of the appropriate gender must belong. Thus, all non-chief men in the Samoan village belong to the men's organization, the Almaga. All unmarried women and widows belong to the women's organization, the Awaluma. As with all gender organizations, the Aumaga and Awaluma serve to organize collective activities at the largest possible level to accomplish community-wide goals. The Aumaga is responsible for public works projects like clearing new land for cultivation, building new council houses, or coordinating large fishing expeditions. The Awaluma is tasked with ceremonial and hospitality jobs like hosting visiting dignitaries or putting on community festivals. All of this, of course, takes place under the guidance of the chiefs of the Fono. Thus, if we compare the three chiefdom-organized societies we've examined in this unit, we see three very different political organizations. Among the Azandi, a high chief is aided by sub-chiefs who have their own legitimate authority to make decisions for the households in their separate districts. Among the Baseri, a single chief holds all the authority and local headmen simply serve to communicate his decisions. Samoan chiefdoms are governed by a single council that includes multiple chiefs of different ranks, aided by the non-chiefly gender organizations. Chiefdom organization, then, is like band and tribal organization. None of them are a single thing. Rather, each label designates a class of systems that share structural similarities. In the case of chiefdoms, ranking and hierarchy. Most of what anthropologists understand about Samoan culture is due to the regular visits made by anthropologists to the islands throughout the 20th century. The first and most important anthropologist to work there was Margaret Mead in the 1920s. Margaret Mead is a towering figure in anthropological history. One of the first prominent women anthropologists, she focused her research on questions of gender in an era when women were often ignored by ethnographers. But her influence goes way beyond gender alone and touches almost all aspects of contemporary anthropological practice. Her landmark work on Samoa, Coming of Age in Samoa, was published in 1928 and waded into the very murky waters of the nature-nurture debate. At the time, Anthropology, sociology, and psychology were deeply embroiled in the debate over the degree to which biology influenced human action. 
Are we all programmed by our DNA and psyche to behave in certain ways? Or are we the products of our upbringing and environment? And different environments would produce different outcomes. Part of this debate was taking place among psychologists and dealt with adolescents. Based on their examinations of Western youth, psychologists argued that adolescence was inevitably tumultuous and angst-ridden. As young folk formed their adult identities, they inevitably rebelled against their elders and disrupted their communities. Mead studied this question by working with teenage Samoan girls. She found that Samoan teenagers were generally not angst-ridden or rebellious, and that they generally were free to explore their identities and transition to adulthood without any major upheaval. She concluded that the tumult of American adolescence was due to American culture, not human nature. That explanation became widely accepted in anthropology for several decades until, in 1983, five years after Mead's death, Derek Freeman challenged it. He concluded, based on his own ethnographic work in Samoa, that Mead had significantly misrepresented Samoan culture. He argued that Mead overlooked ample evidence of disruption, disagreement, and even violence, either through misunderstanding or through negligence. Instead, Freeman presented a view of Samoan culture that supported his own theory that human nature is fundamentally competitive and aggressive. This sparked a widespread debate in the anthropological community in the early 1980s. Who was right? Was Mead negligent in her work? And was it ethical of Freeman to wait until she had died and couldn't respond before he challenged her research? Ultimately, the Mead-Freeman debate led to a reconsideration of how anthropologists draw conclusions and how we rely on older ethnographic works. But the question of whose picture of Samoan society is most accurate remains somewhat open. Finally, let's look briefly at the relationship between the eastern part of the Samoan Islands and the U.S. The U.S. Navy took possession of American Samoa in 1925 and turned control over to the Department of the Interior in the 1950s. American Samoa is classed as an unincorporated territory of the U.S. Today, its residents are considered U.S. nationals, but not citizens. That means they can't vote in federal elections beyond sending a single non-voting representative to the U.S. House of Representatives, but they can carry U.S. passports and travel and live in the U.S. without a visa. When these travel policies went into effect in the 1950s, it began the Great Migration of Samoans, first to Hawaii, the closest U.S. state, and then to the U.S. West Coast. Today, there are as many Samoans living in the mainland U.S. as in American Samoa itself. Their traditional system of aiga and matai remains intact, however, just transplanted to a new place and new context showing the resilience and endurance of a system developed over thousands of years.